Et bonjour à tout le monde euh, ici et euh, à les institutions de nous. Euh, je suis heureux de, de voir. Euh, Merci. Merci. Je suis heureux de, de voir les nombreuses personnes en personne. Um, and I will switch to English. So I'm very, very happy to uh, have the honor to introduce Ludwig Martinou, uh, a person I do not need to introduce in this circle, but uh, I will do so. He's professor in uh, our own engineering and physics department, uh, chairholder of the multi-sectoral industrial research chair in coatings and surface engineering. He is the co-director of the GCM, Groupe d'Ecoutement, uh, well known to the RPMP, and a uh, member of the RPMP Executive Committee, and co-leader of the Access 4 uh, Materials uh, for New Technologies. He was the head of the Department of uh, Genie Physique and uh, the former president of the Society of Vacuum Cultures. As you will see, his research interests are, uh, his main interests are in surface engineering, thin films and coatings and uh, plasma processing of materials. Um, his activities resulted in an impressive number of more than 420 publications in reverie books, uh, journals, book chapters, conference proceedings, and 18 patents. And he is uh, the recipient of numerous awards, among them, awards from the uh, the Society of Vacuum Cultures, the American Vacuum Society, and the Answer Synergy Award, uh, together with Yolanda Sapiera. And this year, he won the uh, Pulitzer Award for Excellence in Research and Innovation. And with this, I want to hand over to Ludwig, and thank you for presenting <coughs> the work here. Okay. So, well, um, bonjour tout le monde, c'est vraiment plaisir d'être ici sur le campus en présentiel avec peut-être quelques questions le jus café et probablement j'ai entendu dire que j'aurais même le pizza qui va venir. <rire> Alors, je pense que c'est un bon début d'une nouvelle habitude après euh, la COVID-19. <rire> uh, so, well, uh, hello everybody in the room here. Uh, so we have maybe some 30, 40 people, which is great. Which I believe uh, is more than we had in the recent past. But also, I believe there are quite a few people on the Zoom. Uh, if somebody sees that uh, you don't see me, you don't hear me, so please let me know that uh, I can move the hands differently or uh, do the things differently. So before actually continuing uh, uh, or starting, actually, I wanted to remind everybody, we are all part of the RQMD, right? Everybody knows what RQMD is. And we are very happy that uh, the answer at QRMD has renewed uh, the QRMD uh, for the next uh, six years, especially uh, uh, the, the leadership of Francois, who is here. So thank you. I should remind everybody that we actually have five uh, research access within the RQMD. And it would be really very nice if we can think about that uh, the different axes are represented relatively uniformly by different presentations from all the areas which we represent either here at Polytechnic Pierre or maybe in the foil uh, or in, uh, in Sherbrooke. Now, um, the subject of today's talk is uh, surface engineering in general. And I would start always, like always, with uh, this interesting collection of pictures which shows uh, applications ranging from, uh, uh, from building industrial or architectural glass um, uh, equipment with uh, uh, electronics, like film electronics or cameras or cell phones, which by themselves include hundreds of uh, symptoms which are related to surface engineering, which we are interested in. And if we look even farther, we are looking at uh, different types of applications, automobile industry, aerospace, uh, domestic products, biomedical applications. So surface engineering is really the keyword and very important aspect of this because that the way how they assure the performances of materials, how they behave in all of the different uh, applications. So what we have done in our laboratory over the uh, few decades, and especially in collaboration with Yolanda and uh, many others who are also here in the room, 
uh, we are focusing on uh, what we like to call multifunctional coding. So what is multifunctional coding? Well, if you look at uh, a substrate A material, which we would like to uh, modify in a way that it uh, reacts or behaves appropriately for different applications, we have different layers. We can have optical, electrical, mechanical, electrochemical, and different other functions. But either those functions are combined in one layer, or each layer has a different function, and then we go to the design table and start thinking about how to make a layer structure which would be durable, which would be manufacturable, in which case this uh, structure would be compatible with substrates, with the environment of use, and of course, uh, when we were in this industry, what would be the cost of it? So this is the first thing. The second thing is, what is quite important is that we see the application surface engineering solutions in different sectors. And as a matter of fact, I'd like to say that probably about 80% of all the methodology which is developed, the processes, materials, and different other concepts, are transferable from uh, one sector to the other, which is a great message because if you develop a certain approach, a certain solution, you can then more easily switch and find solutions in other areas. This is great news for our students as well. Why? Because if they get trained in one of these individual areas, then they can easily switch or find jobs in all the others, right? So this is, um, I think, our dual role as professors, namely, I think, training the students, but also contributing to innovation. Now, over the years, what we have done is uh, we really would like, as an engineering school, to contribute to the advancement of uh, technology. So we work quite extensively with industry. And in order to work closely with industry, one has to understand the real life problem. So we start with thinking about the solutions, but we also keep in mind the final application. So in that respect, we are really concerned about what are uh, the requirements for our coping systems, how they should perform as they would satisfy uh, the requirements. But in order to do that, we need the testing methods. We can use standards, but very often when we are pushing the technology, we don't have these methods these standards. We have to develop our own in order to make sure that we can validate our approaches. So we are developing techniques which are with the sure of the functions, as I mentioned, the optical, mechanical, electric, and others. But we also very much are concerned about the stability, the performance of these in the uh, uh, environment of work. If there are any, what are the degradation mechanisms? So, like, what can stop them? How can mitigate them? And for more, we are concerned about the life cycle analysis. We have because we have to start thinking about where the materials comes from, how the methodologies or methods of fabrication are polluting, and what will happen with these materials at the end of life. So only then we can start thinking about what would be the best material, what would be the designs of those structures and by function for the one that I mentioned, what would be the most suitable methods to fabricate these before validating our approach and then possibly transfer our knowledge to industry. So what I was thinking about and I discussed with my colleagues. So I prepared a presentation and still during the weekend, uh, they said, well, it is used for three hours. So I thought it would be probably better to shorten it so there will be more time for pizza. So what I was thinking to do is uh, to show you only two case studies from two different areas. One, which is close to our heart, combining uh, optical coatings and energy aspects. And then the second part, which is probably closer to the blood that is responsible for, but still, I will mention a few words about it, the next generation green manufacturing in the context of aerospace. Now, in the column, you know, the right, since we are talking about the axis four, about the new technologies for the future, I wanted to show a few examples of new techniques and techniques which have not been really, uh, too much before, which can actually satisfy some of the requirement for those different applications. So we start with, uh, with the architectural law. Uh, this is something which is uh, quite pertinent here, because if we look at uh, the building sector, we find out that 76% uh, of electricity uh, is used in the building sector only. So it means that the building sector is a large consumer of uh, um, electric power. But uh, which is only in the US represents 40% of the uh, primary energy. 
Now, we should also think about what happened with uh, the energy which is used in the building sector. And we find out that about 40% of this energy is lost by different uh, types of losses. And 60% of those losses are through the windows by radiated process. So that's why we focus on uh, uh, trying to find out how we can benefit from uh, developing the surface engineering approaches uh, so that we can increase the budget or energy budget related to heating, cooling, refrigeration, ventilation, and so on. Now, I should also mention, so I think it all goes together with uh, the way how people like to live these days, because it is some sort of a country intuitive, because uh, on one side, we would like to use less energy or use it more efficiently, but people like to construct buildings next to each other because one square meter costs those millions of dollars and they can make and uh, can gain the money. So then you actually, from a microscopic point of view, a city like that, Hong Kong, in this particular case, acts as a collector, right? All the light coming in actually bounces uh, back and forth in between the building gets trapped. And that's why in uh, large city agglomerations, the temperatures are typically at least five degrees higher in average than in the surroundings. So what is the point when we speak about the, the windows? Well, one of the solutions which has been around already for a couple of decades are the so-called low, uh, low emissivity. What does it mean? Well, as we, we uh, agree that the windows are the main culprit of uh, energy loss, how we can control the radiative energy which goes through the window. So we want to uh, assure that the window is still transparent because it's our main means of communicating uh, from the outside to the inside and vice versa. But it is a very weak point from the thermal point. So what we want to do, we have actually double the role of these windows. We want to assure high transmission in the visible region, and we want to control the infrared radiation. We reduce the radiation which comes from the sun and gets into the building, so we can reduce the, uh, the heating budget, or uh, from uh, the inside towards outside, especially in northern countries, where we would uh, save money on the, uh, on the heating of the building. So in that particular case, there are the codings, they control passively the energy which passes through, and we have to uh, control the parameters which we I already mentioned, but especially the solar uh, gain and the near direct. Now, uh, the uh, status of the technology is rather uh, indicated here. You see some patterns which uh, are behind uh, uh, the uh, low technology, but most of the applications include high conductivity metals, so in this particular case, silver, which is surrounded by what you can call function coatings. And the functions of these coatings are they can act as a seed layer, they can act as a, a reflective barrier layer, they can uh, act as a protection against oxidation, mechanical abuse, and so on. So this is what uh, is the first. The second step is, well, we would like to have structures which uh, would contain not maybe only one single silver layer, but maybe several silver layers, because then we can reduce uh, the uh, transmission in the near infrared without really affecting too much uh, the uh, transmission in the visible. Now, from the uh, technical technological point of view, we would also understand that using uh, one layer, three layers, four layers of silver, which is maybe 10 nanometers in thickness, if we can get the same performance and maybe even a better performance at uh, thicknesses which are below those 10 nanometers, then this can lead to important savings. Every nanometer would represent, let's say, 10% of uh, economic benefits uh, when it comes to production, and you will see that amount is just in the uh, so this is the first step. Now, the second step is, well, this is very nice. So we have those passive low key windows, but can we do somehow better? Can we, for example, think about uh, active coatings or dynamic coatings, which would, uh, when we can adjust the transmission in the infrared, depending on if the wall is facing south, west, east, and so on, if you are in the northern hemisphere, but, or more equatorial and so on. 
So what I will do now is I will say a few words about uh, developing the coding systems and processes uh, for thermochromic because it uh, creates a nice story. But we have also worked uh, on the electrochromic that can be another one hour of presentation and so on, which I will not do it. Yeah. So in addition, we would like to look at the thermochromic properties, possibly in combination with so E, but also about some additional functions to be fantastic. Uh, just a, an example here, Guardian Industries is a web company which uh, supplies the uh, windows for the uh, Bush Al Khalifa in, uh, um, in Saudi Arabia. And this is one of the buildings which is fully equipped with the uh, windows in Montreal, uh, supplied by Guardian. This is Concordia. Not uh, All right. We spoke about the uh, industrial concept. So imagine now that to fabricate coatings on the glasses, glass for windows for architectural applications, um, the individual substrates, plates, are um, uh, six meters uh, long and 3.2 meters wide. And one has to deposit those uh, 10, 20 layers of uh, individual uh, coatings with the silver controlled to one nanometer thickness. And uh, there are 10, 20 layers. So you have those rays usually uh, containing two parallel cylindrical magnetrons, which are four meters in length. And uh, the line, this is just an experimental slide. The real line con uh, contains all those many rays, how many layers we need. There is one sheet of glass which is moving every 30 seconds through that, and it goes on without interruption for seven years. So now you can imagine the technology which is behind that. So if you are thinking about the new ways how to implement new techniques, there is a lot of investment in it. So we have to think about how to uh, adjust the new technology which can be accepted by the industry which is already there. Uh, Target industries, uh, the production is typically 75 million square meters per year, which is a uh, a uh, non negligible fraction of what is the um, world annual production, which is 500 uh, million square meters of coffee glass and constructions and every case. So, if we think, think about thermochromic uh, smart windows, so what we actually would like to accomplish, we would like to find a situation that we have our window and we would have uh, a switch from the cold state to the warm state. So, at the uh, cold state, we would have uh, radiation coming in, in the visible region, in the near infrared region, and when we switch above the critical temperature, then the infrared radiation will be reflected and the visible will be transmitted, and so the window will still be functioning, there will be no communication. So in that case, the notoriously uh, known material, which is the most performing material, is VO2. The advantage of the VO2 is, uh, well, it works uh, very well, you will see uh, the benefits of that. Uh, it has a uh, transition temperature around 68 degrees C, changing from the semiconductor homogeneic structure to the dragon of metallic structure. So this was the one to do. And uh, if you uh, fabricate such a coating, what we see, we, we want to assure the switching, but not at 68 degrees, uh, it will come when uh, the climate change will. From for, say, for a while, right? So we would like to bring this temperature a little bit lower. We can do it. We can bring it down to the room temperature by doping a few percent of tungsten or molybdenum or other. Uh, well, some people would say, but it's quite a ugly color, right? They would not like to have our uh, buildings and even the domestic uh, windows of this color. So we can benefit from optical filters, from plasmonic particles embedded in such structures to give uh, nice new uh, interesting uh, colors. But we would like to also increase the visibility in the uh, visible region. So you see here, uh, this is the photopic uh, uh, region of the human eyes, where we have the most uh, sensitivity of the eyes. So we would like to increase the transmission in that area. So this is also possible when you find the reflective coding supplying uh, nanoparticles in the structure. So this is all this stuff in literature. But still a few years ago, uh, we were all limited by the high temperature which we needed to fabricate this VO2 thermochromic material. 
uh, to get the upper grade mental analysis. Which brings me to a point which I would like to underline here. Can we find a technique or technology which would allow us to fabricate the stable VO2 films, which uh, can be fabricated at lower temperature and have even a better performance than what has been applied before? So, this is the first new technique which I wanted to describe here, namely the high phase, high power input, and sputtering. So, this is a technique that instead of using uh, continuous uh, uh, signal applied to the target where we accelerate the ions, which would uh, uh, sputter the material by, uh, by momentum transfer. We actually divide the power in very short pulses, where the individual pulses, instead of uh, uh, containing the 100 watt, let's say, of average, uh, average power, if we compact that in uh, duration of pulses of uh, some tens or hundreds of a microsecond. These can be megawatt individual pulses. What does it mean? Like if you look here, uh, if you look at uh, decreasing the duty cycle, this is what I scale, we can look at the peak power density, which is kilowatt per square centimeter. So if we are somewhere around one uh, kilowatt per square centimeter, which is very difficult to cool, such a target that we want to operate it in a, at a lower duration of the pulses. So we, if we pulse it, we still have the uh, cooling power of the magnetrons. But what happens here, the power density is so high that we can actually uh, ionize most of the gas which is in front of our target. So if we ionize it, we have two possibilities. There are more, more ions which are available for sputtering. And at the same time, we can fabricate our coatings on the other side from ionized metal. What does it mean that we can do it? It means that we can use uh, a higher density plasma, which uh, leads to high fluxes towards the substrate. If we can increase the fluxes of energetic ions towards the surface, we can densify the materials, we can control the uh, grain size, density of the material, and so on. The stress, for example. So this is what is open here by using uh, the hybrids. Now, if you look at uh, the different ways how we apply the hydrogen, we find out that the window parameters which uh, allow us to control uh, the process uh, characteristic is a little bit narrower than the standard sputtering process. So we have also to develop the diagnostic tools which allow us to do that properly. And as a matter of fact, this is an example of uh, uh, the uh, development of the space and time result of the spectroscopy, where we would have uh, a target on the left side when we generate the plasma in the vicinity, we will rely on the uh, secondary electron generation, which will uh, enter the plasma zone, the electrons that are associated with the ionized uh, the surrounding gas, uh, the background gas plus the asphalt material. And then, of course, the material from the target would move to the subsurface right? So we would have, for example, a frequency spectrometer, which would be uh, connected to, uh, to an optical fiber, so we can then move straight and forth and uh, assure spatial distribution of uh, the plasma characteristics. And if we combine that with uh, a high speed camera, we can actually look at the, uh, uh, at the transient effects uh, when it is fast enough. So, for example, uh, we have found that the ions, depending on the type of the ion and the size, uh, they uh, move the speeds which are com commensurable with cosmic speeds, uh, several kilometers per second, up to 10, 12 kilometers per second. For that now, uh, well, I think everybody knows that we also work in the field of optical coding, so we like to fabricate optical filters, but there is only one more step to put in front of our camera and in front of our optical fiber, an optical filter, uh, which would select the specific part of the spectrum where we can focus on the individual uh, species which are in the gas. So in that case, we, we can add also the uh, species resolution to our definition trust of it, and then we can look at the movement of different species from the target towards the substrate and understand better how uh, the things are growing and how we can control the process. So this is probably a key uh, picture which uh, uh, underlines the importance of the diagnostic approaches. Uh, for example, as you look here, this is a waveform where we have a current, 
uh, we have the voltage applied to the target. And this is what happens with the voltage of the, with the voltage on the current during one individual pulse, which is typically in this particular case 200 microseconds. So if you look at, uh, for example, uh, what is the uh, structure of the plasma or the properties of the plasma during the individual period during the pulse, we see examples of what happens after three microseconds, 33, 53, 73. So we see here, if there is no filter, we just see the light come down. So we have an averaging effect. So we see here that there's a combination of all the emission lines from the plasma. But if we put the filter looking at argon, for example, the argon lines, we see that uh, at the very beginning, uh, the argon line is very high. So we have more ionized argon, excited argon in front of the target. And only then we start generate, generating more metal, which is stuck to the surface, which also gets uh, ionized to the substrate. And if you look at the, at the metal here, this is in the case. So then uh, in the subsequent part of the pulse from the here, uh, the emission from the metal is increased, but are going to be. So there are several conclusions from that, which are quite important. First of all, uh, we can see that uh, we have certain periods which are rich in argon, the carrier gas, for example, uh, which is uh, more rich in the, in the metal which is covered. So we can now start thinking about that on our substrate level, we can apply different voltages, which would uh, preferentially attract some of these ions, accelerate them, and contribute to the full growth. And if we synchronize these voltages, we can assure periods where we would have uh, uh, less argon. So, for example, we might have like five microseconds and microseconds delay before. before uh, are from the beginning of the individual pulse, when the metal ions would arrive to the surface, and we would uh, omit the argon, for example, which can lead to substantial decrease of, uh, of mechanical stress, for example, in the cone. We can also uh, apply different biases, different uh, synchronization strategies, which can also favor the growth of different uh, crystalline structures in the, in the material, depending on what we uh, really would like, uh, like to do. Now, uh, what is also interesting here, it alludes to what is called self sputtering because so basically what comes here at the beginning after the first period of uh, uh, the discharge in argon, we have the discharge which is mostly populated by the metal, and these are metal ions themselves, which uh, 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 lead to, which lead to self sputtering so we actually can even switch off uh, the carry gas with uh, with, uh, <coughs> with uh, now, so coming back to the vanadium dioxide, uh, well, uh, using this approach, uh, we found that uh, one can fabricate very high quality thermochromic vanadium dioxide, but at lower temperatures compared to what has been published in the literature. So you see here the comparison of our own data from uh, the last thesis of uh, some years ago, and where we have uh, different values of this. Uh, Delta P, which is the variation of transmission at uh, 2.45 microns, uh, when I was describing the properties of uh, the thermographic materials in the red region, compared to other papers, other uh, publications in works where the same type of performance was obtained at uh, 400, 500 uh, degrees. Why is this also important? Because, first of all, uh, we can fabricate terms which are more dense, which are more stable. But at the same time, we can also start thinking about fabricating them on a uh, thermally sensitive substrate such as plastics. So if we can do that, uh, if we can apply a, a good quality uh, thermochromic vanadium dioxide to a polymer, we can start thinking about retrofitting the already existing windows in the building. So we don't need to change the whole uh, windows and the glazing. We can just only laminate the existing structure with uh, an overcoated uh, vanadium dioxide layer uh, to assure the thermochromic. So, this is uh, one of the very important uh, uh, use when uh, one develops. Now, one of the ways, as I mentioned, would be to look at the possibility to implement uh, the thermochromic material in the existing technologies. Um, so this is an example of the work uh, performed by Bill with uh, collaborators in uh, our laboratory in the local city. Uh, so what uh, we have seen before, well, 
if we look at uh, the performance of iron dioxide, we have seen that the transmission is not very high, so below 50%, maybe. So if we apply a uh, reflective layer, uh, both between the vanadium dioxide and underlying glass and on the top layer, we can increase the transmission of the effect. Now, in addition to the thermochromic effect, if we combine that with silver, we can look at how the structure will behave with respect to okay, the most standard uh, low emissivity. So what is important here, we would be evaluating the main characteristics, namely the luminous transmittance. So the luminous transmittance would be the light coming in the visible region, which is actually felt by the human eye. And then the solar transmitting variation, which would be related to the reduction of uh, the uh, radiation energy when we switch from the transparent to the less transparent state of our code, uh, going up to the uh, near infrared region, let's say 2.5 micron. So this is an example of the calculations which are behind the optimization of the design that we would like to use. Uh, of course, using our open filters uh, software, which uh, has been uh, developed in our laboratory. So if you look at uh, the vanadium dioxide alone, so we will have certain characteristics uh, related to uh, the uh, luminous transmittance on the uh, delta T uh, transmission variation as a function of the thickness. So we will be looking for the thickness of uh, our VO2 where we can maximize all these parameters. So if we apply uh, the reflective layers in the nitrate in this particular case, uh, we see a substantial improvement, especially in the transmission. And then in combination with silver here, uh, we see an important increase of uh, uh, delta solar while maintaining the high transmission. Uh, so this has been then uh, reproduced in the laboratory. So you see here uh, two different effects. I'll do different examples. One is the VO2 surrounded by the antidepressive players formed by uh, silicon nitride. So we see here an increase in transmission from 50 to 70 percent, let's say. And then, of course, the uh, switching uh, from the high transmission at uh, low temperature and less transmission at high temperature. If we combine with silver, we see here, well, we still maintain uh, more or less the transmission to the visible region. And we can also modulate. The transmission to the unit, right? So we have the effects of both that around. So in this case, if you look at the uh, log E or emissivity, so if there is uh, no silver, which is sure the reflectivity in the red region, I mean, uh, at the Cylon, the uh, emissivity is quite high, but with the silver, and this is actually the contribution from the low E coating side, is uh, close to 10%, which is commensurable with. Uh, Commercial coating these days. And I should remind that when we evaluate the facility, it is related to 1 minus R, where R is your reflectance, and the reflectance is measured over a broad wavelength range. In our case, uh, the phase uh, uh, Now, as I mentioned before, when developing the technology, we can also look at other functions and maybe also other applications which are, are suitable. And uh, so we can benefit even in other fields. This is where the multi sectorial aspects come in. And one of them is uh, the explanation of space. So if we look at uh, a satellite, for example, it is uh, here, of course, the satellites uh, move from the orbit and they are exposed to the radiation from the sun. So if they are exposed to the radiation, their temperature can increase quite substantially because of the of the heat load of the flux, 1,300 watt per square meter, and in shadow, uh, the value is much, much lower. So the satellite itself is very much heated on the sun side and very much cool on the other side. Now, what is very important, there is only a certain range of uh, temperature, what the payload on the satellite can, uh, can support. So we have to find ways that for the electronic components, for example, uh, the temperatures would be somewhere between, let's say, 0 to 20, 30, 40 degrees C, much far from uh, the limited temperatures which would be given by the open space. So, in one, on one side, we have to protect against the very low temperatures. On the other side, we want also to dispose of 
of the excess energy when it is accumulated by the radiation. Now, it becomes even more important when we start talking about micro nano satellites, because the large satellites, which may weigh a ton or so, doesn't matter if they use some other uh, thermal control systems, either uh, thermostatic, thermostatic, thermostatic meters or louvers, which are mechanic and so on. So if you would like to uh, decrease the load, uh, the mass also of the satellite, when we speak about the people satellite, it's just here, or nano satellite, which may be several tens of centimeters in size. So from this point of view, uh, we see a benefit of uh, using the uh, vanadium uh, dioxide thermochromic coating as a, a substantial important part of what we call a uh, smart radiator device. In which case, we would have a system uh, which, uh, uh, in which we can trap the heat, but also when the temperature exceeds the sensor value, then uh, the heat would be uh, radiated or re emitted uh, to the space for active uh, radiated cooling. So, this is uh, part of uh, the work which uh, has been done some time ago. There was a masterpiece of Claudine uh, uh, Ine. So this is the concept where we have a substrate with a reflective layer, which can be metal. Then we have a dielectric spacer and the monochromic layer on, on top. Now, if we do the uh, calculations locally in 1989, we can find out that uh, we find an optimum uh, combination of thicknesses of the materials, which can be used. And one important parameter here is the thickness of the, of the spacer in this particular case, calcium dichloride. So calcium dichloride is a material that has a very long refractive index. I mean, this is a uh, uh, picture depicting uh, the uh, values of uh, the variation of emissivity as a function of thickness of these two materials, vanadium dioxide, calcium dichloride, uh, by maximizing uh, the work dioxide. So when we reproduce that and, uh, in the laboratory and we measure them, so we look at the case of those uh, seven microns to 75 microns, we see here at the low temperature, the reflectance is high, so the emissivity is low, uh, because the emissivity is one minus i, and when the temperature is high, then uh, the material, the surface radiates the energy, energy out, and we see here the button, uh, Maximum evaluated effect around the micro for which actually this uh, system has been, has been optimized. One other application, which is very interesting, which is also commensurable, com uh, compatible with uh, the architectural class, but also may find uh, applications in other areas, is looking at the effect of nanostructures and how we can actually benefit from that in adding new functions. And in this particular case, the angular selectivity. So we would have a higher transmission in one particular direction while hampering the light transmission in other directions. So we can uh, improve the visibility. We can also control the energy of uh, radiation coming in and out of the building. It can be also used for applications, for example, on the windshields where the driver is driving, the windshield is inclined. We would like to see the car uh, coming in front of us that would protect against the solar radiation and so on. We can think about implementing these kind of lenses. So the principle is here, uh, of course, that uh, the angle deposition technique has been around already for a few decades. But what is important here, we would like to benefit from the optical properties of the individual layers, where we can assure appropriate transmission, for example, but also the reflectivity. So we would fabricate these inclined structures and uh, allowing the flux of uh, evaporated material towards the substrate at an inclined angle. And because of the shadowing effect, we would then form things like uh, uh, columns on the surface. Now, what is very important, we can think about uh, the core of this column being very transparent. So this is indeed what we would like to publish. And then we can tune the performance of this column by applying a, a reflecting or absorbing layer on top of it to tune the reflectivity in the transmission frame. So uh, in that case, we would like to have a second technique which would allow some form of coating of the columns. And this is uh, in a layer deposition. 
So we can fabricate the basic structure of things like over here, and uh, all the coated is uh, a layer on top, which can be done uh, absorbing or reflecting. For example, taking a nitride using the uh, platinum plate position, and if need be, you can use also additional plasma excitation when it comes to the courses which uh, need more active oxygen, for example, from the gas. So, this is an example of such structures where we deposit uh, the inclined angle but rotary that we substrate. So, because of the shadowing effect, what deposits on this side then could be compensated from the other side. So, we will have columns which will be perpendicular to the surface. And as a matter of fact, if we fabricate silicon dioxide columns, the total content is the same layer of silicon nitride, for example. We see here that both polarization S and P are identical, so we don't have this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, angular selectivity effect. However, if we are positive at a one inclined angle, then we can see here that the transmission is higher as on the face of P polarization on the part of the light arriving in the surface, which propagates uh, uh, with high intensity compared with the S polarization. And indeed, there is a nice example of uh, uh, building the substrate, which I kindly built with me, that it is more transmit, uh, high transmission in this particular case along the length of the, of the columns as compared to looking perpendicular direction. Now, what is interesting here, this is a nice microscopic combination of, uh, uh, the, uh, of the nanostructures. So we would have the, the columns, which would be formed by the silicon uh, on the rod of the column, uh, column, if you want. And then uh, we can uh, overcoat it like a shell uh, with titanium or titanium nitride, which uh, is growing on, on top of that. And the thickness can be uh, controlled by, by the number of, uh, of uh, policies of the particular uh, position process. All right. So with that, uh, I would uh, switch to the next section. And I know that uh, uh, you have seen already the pack of pizzas. So I will uh, accelerate a little bit. And I can assure you that this part is a little bit shorter than the first one. So let's speak about the uh, new generation grid manufacturing. And there is only one technique which we will talk about, namely uh, the whole cut of PC. But still, before doing that, a little bit of retrospection uh, global picture of what happens with materials when they are exposed to the hostile environment. And this is really very important when we look at how much losses we have due to wear and due to corrosion. If we look at what's happening just in Canada, uh, the statistics says uh, 2019, more than 50 billion US dollars lost because of corrosion. And then uh, about 3% of GDP just because of surface deterioration by corrosion. If you look more globally, uh, the, it represents about almost 1.5 uh, uh, trillion dollars. Uh, so this would be the uh, statistics in the US and Europe and other countries, how much is lost by the deterioration technique. So surface engineering in this particular case is really very important because we can slow down the process, we can protect the surfaces, and uh, again, both uh, 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 economically, but also from the environmental perspective. Now, there are two effects which are clear and important for that, and this is we have to understand correctly what are the mechanisms of failure, because if you understand them, we can then use a slide of the appropriate surface solutions. There is another interesting slide which I borrowed from Ivanka. Uh, this is a more introduction into uh, the economics of the, uh, of the impact of the uh, transportation sector. So if you look at uh, the CO2 emissions uh, in different sectors, we see that the transportation represents about 22% compared to, of course, uh, uh, electricity production, manufacturing, and so on. But if you look at the transportation in general, uh, of course, automobiles uh, uh, represents most of the CO2 emissions, but aerospace still not non negligible number of uh, 11%. So if you look at uh, how the uh, aircraft uh, operates, you find out that uh, uh, if you take business aircraft, so you have very few, uh, maybe uh, 
of people who are willing to pay for uh, uh, for the travel, the uh, the uh, emission of CO2 is much higher than for passengers than in commercial uh, What is really important here is that if nothing is done, we could retain the numbers that we are now uh, in uh, 2019. So in uh, 2050, uh, the emission would be generated by the aerospace industry, which is by a factor of the concept, which is very important. All right. So, still as a part of the introduction of this section, if you look at an aircraft, which uh, this is uh, the new model of the computing by the aircraft, uh, there can be surface engineering solutions and coatings in all those different areas. And I would say, we want to confirm that, that we have worked on uh, many other projects for uh, all of them, which is very important, including in, in direct uh, benefits like uh, coping for cutting tools or water erosion of different components. So, so, what I would do now is to just to say a few examples about erosion resistance coatings for the engine and uh, uh, illustrate that by the surface engineering approach. Now, I would uh, uh, step back a little bit. This is not only the aerospace industry which may benefit from the engines and benefits from that, but also manufacturing in general. This is an example of a industrial valve, in which case uh, you see a wall uh, which uh, turns in a way to open the valve or close uh, the valve, but you can imagine the uh, chemical environment, uh, thermodynamic environment in which it operates. Uh, which leads to wear corrosion on the surface of the importance is to be able to turn and to uh, uh, actuate such a valve very quickly in a reproducible way for a long period. Something similar applies to the aircraft engine. So the entrance of the air is here. We have the compressor part where the air is compressed and then the comp uh, when the air is injected by the user in the combustion chamber, and then of course it is felt and, uh, and propels uh, the engine. What is important here that this uh, the uh, in, uh, entrance of the uh, of the gas it also uh, uh, brings a lot of dust and small particles, which actually lead to erosion of the surfaces. So the impact of erosion is very important because it can affect the aerodynamics of the individual components. So if the aerodynamics is slow, then of course consumption of kerosene is higher, which is higher contamination, and the efficiency of the engine is lower as well. At the same time, it can have a huge also a catastrophic effect. Now, another important thing is here, all the components are not flat. They are three-dimensional, so when developing coatings, one has to think about other techniques which we will apply be compatible with the shape and form and size of the component we would like to, to cover. Now, in addition to that, in aerospace, for example, in the aircraft engine, one has to make sure that the new techniques, new processes do not affect the long term stability, like fatigue of the component. And we know that the fatigue starts by defects at the surface, which can then propagate the okay, understanding of the so if you look at that, we have the engine and uh, the components, which are uh, three-dimensional. They are very, very costly. So such individual pieces uh, can cost uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars, just individuals, just changing it. It's costly. The material for the engine is costly. So if we can protect that, we have to think about what would be uh, the type of design on the micro scale. So what would be uh, the sequence of layers, which would be typically five millimeter thick, and for the individual layers, how we can assure the appropriate mechanical properties of the individual layers uh, to provide appropriate uh, mechanical durability. So it is a multi-scale uh, aspect, and of course we have to think about the life cycle configuration, where the materials come uh, from, then where the materials depend. Now this is not very surprising because of the cost issues. And fabrication issues, one would be also interested in uh, being able to remove damaged surfaces, damaged coatings, and then get a coat the surfaces without protecting the, the particles of structure. So, here's an example of what uh, has been done in our laboratory some years ago, which is the highest reported uh, 
and also resistance uh, to solid particles, for example, alumina uh, 50 microns in size uh, uh, at the speed of 90 meters per second. So you see here a design which is based on titanium alloy, which by itself has a hardness of some 8 uh, gigapascal. And then if you 3D interface, apply a matching layer, and then slowly apply other layers with uh, continuously increased hardness, maybe up to some 50 gigapascal for the titanium silicon carbon nitride, which at the same time is also elastic. We can reduce uh, the erosion rate quite substantially. This uh, goes in hand in hand, it has been confirmed by uh, finite element modeling, where, for example, we see the mass loss, which can be substantially decreased for specific values of uh, hardness and gas models. So we see here that in principle, we do not necessarily need the hardest material. We need a material which has a good balance between the hardness and the uh, elastic model, which is related. To the way how the mechanical energy is dissipated in the structure of an impact of individual particles or any other type of mechanical load. So, now uh, for those who are interested in plasma, uh, and just another technique. So, that other technique is uh, uh, suitable for fabricating uh, complex components such as diffuser. So, this is a diffuser where the air which is compressed in the compressor is then ejected in the in the combustion chamber. But the problem is, once again, as I mentioned, uh, in the diffuser, we have the individual channel, which also can be eroded by metal fine uh, uh, part, uh, solid particles inside during the passage of the air. So, so those channels are typically several not millimeters in diameter. And then, of course, uh, we have to think about what would be the uh, length uh, to the diameter ratio. So one has to uh, devise a process which would allow to fabricate uniform hard protective coatings on the surface, like in a, in a group which is shown. So this is the principle of that technique uh, based on the what we call uh, immersion hollow cathode uh, PC process. So we would take such a tube or an array of tubes, put it in a, in a plasma, and then we would apply a voltage to it. So this uh, the component will become a cousin. We would create a plasma inside. So for the diagnostic purposes, we do the tube, we make a slit, so we can do a spectroscopy analysis of what is happening in the tube. And we are looking at uh, under what conditions we can fabricate uh, durable coatings uniformly in, in uh, such tubes. Now, the process is based on uh, what is shown here as a pendulum effect, where if this is a castle, then uh, the walls are of the same potential. So then if it's a castle, of course, the plasma would be looking for the anode, which would be outside. So we would have a very dense plasma inside, the electrons would connect to the castle, to the anode outside. But if we uh, put an appropriate power, if we include uh, an appropriate precursor, which can then be dissociated inside such a model cathode. We can dissociate it with a uh, high uh, efficiency, and then we can initiate the reactions at a high rate inside such a hollow cathode. Now, if we do that, uh, we realize that we benefit from much higher density of the plasma, which can be several orders of magnitude higher than in the standard PC of policy sputtering system or PC system. So this is uh, very beneficial. So we can use very high fluxes towards the surface to uh, fabricate uniform coating. So this is uh, one of the key results uh, where we found that not uh, the continuous wave radio frequency discharge provides appropriate coating because uh, this is the middle of the tube. This is the one half of the tube. So we see here uh, that uh, the thickness is not uniform. We see here that also the microstructure is quite different. So eventually the erosion rate will be different in different parts of the tube. And it takes uh, different frequencies, for example, which would allow uh, to stabilize the plasma, make it uniform in the discharge, but at the same time, to assure also uniform consumption of the precursor entering the tube to make or provide uniform coating across. And this is what happens when you tune the frequency with respect to the pressure, with respect to the dimensions of our component, in this particular case, uh, several kilos. 
and we see here identical characteristics. And with this edge that comes out to the middle, and we see also the microscope. So, so one can count uh, quite complex uh, pieces with uh, uniform coating. One can decrease the erosion uh, stability or uh, resistance by the factor of 15. Uh, this is only done in the night, but this doesn't include the full time layer structure, like I uh, mentioned before. So, the final few slides, and uh, pizza is coming, it's still warm, don't worry. Uh, so, uh, it's related to uh, mechanical stress. And I still want it to be a little impressive because I think it's quite interesting. Uh, this comes from a similar subject, namely uh, protective coatings of aircraft components. When we, for example, can use titanium nitride as a model material fabricated on a titanium alloy substrate. But what is important here, well, titanium nitride has been notoriously used for, of course, manufacturing and other applications. And of course, people, when you look up the literature, always say for the relation between adhesion, performance, and stress. But the stress is, what is usually reported, is the average stress of the code. So what we did, it was in the thesis of uh, Erika Jimenez a few years ago, uh, she looked at uh, the stress depth profile from the surface towards the interface by uh, using uh, using uh, uh, diffraction measurements at uh, uh, at the grazing incidence, so she was able to determine what is the stress on the surface and how the stress profile then varies towards the interface towards uh, the substance. Now, why is this important? Well, uh, for one reason, we don't want that the stress exceeds the stress which uh, would uh, be to make out of the failure of the component, but we can think about that we have now those uh, particles arriving at the surface, which actually impact the surface, and the impact energy is then transformed in certain distribution of the stress near the impact area. So if we can build in, in our system, the stress uh, profile, if you want, in a way that the stress would uh, uh, object or uh, counteract against the infusion particles, or it can be larger objects like a machine, and so on, then we can improve the performance of our method. So, this then uh, was followed by different types of tests to measure the hardest Young's models, but also by the stretch testing to determine the cohesive failure and heat failure, and then micro and tensile testing from which we can determine. What is the elastic regime for the increased performance, and then uh, what, uh, after what strain it leads to uh, the failure of the automation. So, this is now my uh, last transparency. When we see here uh, stress formation, and then, uh, then during the tensile stress, the tensile testing, we see the crack formation. For two situations, this is the type of nitride on the surface, it will be nitrided, so there is a gradient of composition at the interface or uniform. And then if we only expose the surface, to, for example, uh, argon bombardment, titanium implantation. When you look at the result here, this is the uh, coating residual stress. Uh, this is negative because this is stress in compression. So the lowest stress, which is on your right, and this is the highest stress. So we go from the right to the left. And we can look at uh, different key parameters which determine the me mechanical stability of this coding, which can be actually a very interesting uh, uh, data uh, to enter in, for example, finite element modeling, if you would like to understand, calculate what would be the stress distribution and how the stress distribution can uh, counteract against, for example, the impact of fast. So if you look here, we have the uh, crack onset strain. So this is what we saw on the previous slide. So we see at lower stress, the onset strain, the cost is lower, but it, it increases with, uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the higher stress. So the higher stress actually keeps or acts against the expensive testing, so it doesn't open up because the under the cracks. Uh, something similar is for the interstitial spin sheet thread, but also uh, for the energy release rate. How much energy is used when the crack starts to propagate in such a In addition to that, it uh, also 
uh, coincides well with the critical loads for uh, the cohesive uh, failure. And the cohesive failure, so the higher stress, when the fraction is still compact, increases or improves when uh, the stress or negative stress is high. So this brings me to the conclusion just one slide away from the pizza. So uh, I think I was trying to convince you that surface engineering is really multi sectoral, multi functional, can find uh, proposed different system solutions. And uh, the time allows to cover only a small part of it. Um, and then the holistic approach is that we need to start quite important the overall understanding of the problems and then evaluating at what extent our solutions really need the application requirements. Now, as part of it, I gave examples of few techniques which I think are quite interesting from the point of view of uh, industrial applications for uh, future uh, uh, green technology. And as a matter of fact, I showed you just one reference to our earlier work, on, which is a review paper on stress. And it seems that the surface engineering community likes to think and uh, do something about the stress these days. It has been published in 2018 and already has uh, almost 420 citations. So it means that the stress is something that uh, uh, stresses people. <laughs> All right, what are the perspectives? I showed uh, quite a bit of uh, experimental data and I believe it will be very nice in the near future to show also. Some results and perspectives which can be modeled are, are better understood and predicted, especially for predicting the performance of a uh, coding system. Part of it uh, would be also benefiting from machine learning uh, because uh, with uh, the instrumented uh, characterization tools these days, we accumulate so much uh, data which uh, can be or should be processed, which uh, actually yield very interesting correlations. I tried to show you a few examples of uh, applications that are many others, including passive and uh, active behavior of the physical codings. And uh, one particular aspect is the uh, multi sectoral synergy that we can learn from one sector uh, to the other. Uh, for example, in the context of uh, the uh, aircraft engine, I spoke about the compressor, the cold part of the engine, but we also work on the hot part of the uh, of the engine, but we are trying to understand better what is the reflectivity of the radiation of the thermal barrier coatings and how the radiation in the infrared interacts with the highly diffusing uh, material, which is something quite new in the mechanical engineering area, like the mechanical aspects are new for the opticians. So these are the directions which are. Uh, uh, we believe are quite interesting. Now, uh, of course, new sources of energy. Uh, we are talking about the use of hydrogen, green hydrogen is one important aspect of it. I believe there will be some discussions of that more and more in the very near future. And of course, the environmental impact of the processes in the field in the context of climate uh, type analysis, which would be uh, a that sense. So, the final note. Uh, I happen also to help as a guest editor of the special issue of John Martin says about mining, and some of you have uh, contributed to that issue. The deadline is two days. So, those who have still some papers, you can submit them. And I would like to thank our team. Uh, I know that uh, those of our laboratory who are here, they will say, well, this is a little bit outdated. I must have mentioned the COVID situation. Slow down the picture taking a little bit. So, I will uh, take pictures soon. We have been supported by numerous industries, Guardian being one, uh, probably in Canada, another one, actually, in relation to the type of uh, results I showed today, uh, and certainly in Quebec. And uh, we have enjoyed uh, many years of collaboration, of course, uh, in our laboratory with Yolanda, the research associate, with all that uh, well, but also within our PMD and CCM, the Stefan and Akora and Kitka in the context of the LIGO project for which I did have. And of course, for those who may be thinking, thinking about their future failure, 
Thank you very much, Ludwig. Uh, quite an impressive overview over the part of the music. So there'll be a part two of the talk, I guess. That's okay. If the moderator allows to speak for an hour, I can do As you saw, it was interesting. Other questions? I'd like to know what's the role of silver in your, uh, in your coding? Because you only have like a I don't know if you have a few anatomic layers. Well, the, so yeah, the silver is, uh, well, basically, this is the best reflector, right? Because of the very high concentration of electrons. And uh, we would like to make it thin, as thin as possible, to assure a high transmission. So there is a compromise between. Uh, the optical gravity and the reflectivity of a continuous layer in the infrared region and the transmission in the, uh, in the visible. So uh, that's why the, the silver is necessary. Now one can think about other conductive materials, but they, in the majority of cases, are more difficult to fabricate. They would probably not have the same electrical and optical. But this is, as you make it thinner, mm -hmm. Do you transmit the uh, or the infrared compared to the visible? Does it balance, or is it always the same uh, transmitting? So, well, uh, you you have to repeat the question. Maybe it's the question. Yeah, I, so the first thing I have not understood. I thought it's the right of the guitar. So the question is about the role of silver in the uh, in the long uh, coatings. And uh, especially in two wavelength ranges, a little bit as compared to the infrared. So, because of the high uh, conductivity of electrons, the, uh, the reflectance would be uh, uh, very high in the near infrared and far infrared because of, uh, of the high uh, concentration of electrons in mobility, but because of the very thin layer, it would become, uh, uh, it would transmit in the in the uh, visibility. So instead of, uh, for example, like uh, you have seen in the uh, single double and triple silver system, the, the advantage is here, or the way how to go is to uh, multiply uh, the sil same silver layers to assure the transmission, not making one uh, thicker silver layer, because then of course the, uh, the transmission would be able to be much lower. I'm not sure if uh, in response to the, uh, to the question. There's one more question from the audience. And if you uh, want to uh, have a question from Zoom, uh, please write it in the chat and Paul Paquet will uh, read it out. So, that's all. Yes, uh, merci for the presentation. Uh, so, I was wondering if uh, these uh, connected layers on small blades they are quite thick, I think. And uh, quite a lot of compressive stress. There uh, is there a risk of elimination in the harsh environment of the uh, internet. Yes, so that's why uh, many people are here how to solve those problems still to have uh, sufficient uh, compressive stress to uh, provide protection against uh, uh, in a stress propagation or uh, defect propagation on one side but not exceed uh, the stress which would lead to the lamination. So that's why the more continuous distribution of the stress in the coding would be rather beneficial rather than uh, having a abrupt interface where there would be a, a big jump in the, in the stress distribution. Now, I should add to it, and this is what I didn't uh, mention, is that have been both uh, uh, calculation, finite element modeling, but also a practical aspect that uh, the uh, thickness of the layers, for example, protecting against uh, solid particle erosion has to be more than eight uh, micrometers, uh, maybe 10 micrometers. Those the companies which are uh, commercially providing these coatings, and they provide coatings 20 nanometers thickness. So indeed, uh, the system has to be optimized for, uh, for the stress time for adhesion. Uh, uh, very rarely that would be 
only one single layer, it would always uh, a multi layer or graded uh, type of structure. Is it um, okay? Are there further questions in Zoom? I don't see a question. So, uh, which car should I buy if I don't want it to rust? <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, you have a better brand than the furnace. Well, as you, as, as you know, um, some time ago, there have been many other marks of cars in, uh, in Montreal because of the increasing amount of salt. So, mostly many of the European cars didn't survive. And uh, one of the ways uh, to make the car survive was to uh, build cars with uh, much thicker metal. Uh, on the on the body, and of course thicker metal, and then of course provide the surface with uh, a corrosion resistant uh, coat. Now, when it comes to uh, the present cars, uh, I will respond with uh, a type of a joke. Uh, we were told when uh, some years ago we were buying always used cars. People said, buy a car for the taxi drivers. So at that time, it's like GM, there's uh, our more <laughs> Thank you. Okay. If there are no further questions, uh, Ludwig has made a strong case for in person uh, attendances. There is pizza. So um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for being here and thank you, Ludwig, for giving us.